good afternoon, and uh, I appreciate having the opportunity to be here today to talk about uh, a couple different programs. Um, I'll go ahead and start, and my timekeeper is where, because I kind of need a, are you the timekeeper? Okay, one of you. I just need a 10-minute break, so I know if I'm halfway through, I'll either rush through or not, so I'm good. Okay, thank you. Okay, so today I'll just be talking about two things. The first one is the National Plant Board Systems Approach for Nursery Certification. And the second one is just to give you an overview and an update on the research that's being conducted at the National Ornamental Research Site at Dominican University. And the, Nick, the uh, abbreviated name is NORSDEP. And Kathy mentioned that a few minutes ago, so there's some things that she's already explained that makes it easier for me. I can kind of zip right through. Okay, first, I want to just explain briefly what a systems approach is. And a systems approach is looking at various critical control points in a system that's used to identify and evaluate points in a pathway where pests or pathogens could be introduced into your operation. With each critical control, then you have the opportunity to determine how you're going to uh, mitigate that risk by implementing various BMPs and I'll go through and give you some examples of these. And the advantage of the system is that the approach addresses variability and uncertainty. You don't know what pathogen might be coming down the pike, so you have to be prepared, pathogen or insect, you have to be prepared for everything. So what, uh, how this was developed is the um, aeronautics industry, or I'm sorry, NASA, had looked at the food that the astronauts were eating up consuming in space. And so they came up with this HACCP approach, which is the hazard analysis critical control point system to make sure that the astronauts were consuming non-contaminated products, basically. And so it's now, this was many years ago, and then the food industry for many years now has been using it. And then several years ago, Jennifer Park and Nick Grenwald applied this to the nursery system, and it works beautifully. So. Um, I'll be going through that. The document itself, this, um, the HACCP approach with the critical control points, it was designed by entomologists, horticulturists, and uh, plant pathologists, and it was vetted by the nursery industry on a national level. So there were 15 of us across the country that were either in wholesale nurseries, containerized nurseries, greenhouse, or in-ground facilities, and we reviewed these documents and identified what was doable and what was completely not doable, basically. And keep in mind that this is a voluntary program. So it basically, the very top one there, it focuses on the uh, hazard analysis. You go through your nursery, step by step, starting from propagation, going through to your canning process, your field process, and then your scrappage. And you identify in that process where there are points in your system where pathogens or pests can be introduced into your system, and then you mitigate that. You identify, oopsie, you identify those critical control points, you develop best management practices, and for each nursery, because we're all different somehow based on the types of plants that you grow, the water that you use, where you get your soil components from, it's gonna be the BMPs that you have for your facility are gonna be potentially different from somebody else's. And then what's important also in this framework is to identify a scouting program, and I'll be going through that this afternoon when we're over at the nursery doing the tour. Training and documentation, as Kathy had mentioned, is very critical for this. And then also the documentation of your sources, where you buy your stuff in from and who you ship it to. So in case you need to do a traceability report, you can identify or know where you got your items from. So the features of this National Plant Board Systems Approach SANC program, it's a pilot program that they developed. And there are eight nurseries across the country that are participating in this right now. And the whole purpose is so that they're not doing endpoint inspections anymore, which is just a snapshot of what your product looks like before it goes out the door. This is looking at a system, all your production processes, and it's looking at how you can, tr can prevent pathogens or pests from being introduced. So the features of it, one of the main ones is that it's a flexible document. As new technologies are introduced and as science advances and more efficient production practices are achieved, 
then new BMPs are created or modified or eliminated, basically. The benefits are that it addresses not only um, existing pathogens like emerald ash borer, I don't mean pathogens, I mean insects, like emerald ash borer, or new pathogens like Phytophthora tentaculata, or those that are newly emerging like Pierce's disease, the bacterium, and its more efficient vector, the glassy wing sharpshooter. Because early on, the, the vector was very inefficient. It was the blue-green sharpshooter, and it wasn't that much of a problem until WIST showed up and was a much more efficient vector. The advantages of this system's approach is that it potentially can reduce the risk of pest introduction, save on chemical costs, serve as a potential marketing tool, as Kathy had mentioned, and take advantage of the increased compatibility among, among state regulatory programs. So I mentioned that there are eight states in the country that are participating in this national program. Uh, a month and a half ago, we went out to Pennsylvania and did the training of the regulators who are going to be auditors in this program. We developed outreach for the growers, and then it's a three-year program, so further down the line, we'll be looking at you know, how effective was it? Was it really um, worthwhile going through this whole process? So those hazards and critical control points, the CCPs, this is looking at an, a nursery production operation. So you look at the plants, the media, the containers, the production practices, the water, the soil substrate, which is underneath the pots, and then your facility security. So with plants, it's like looking at things from cradle to grave. You're looking at what you buy in or what you go out and collect in the field. You're looking at everything that's coming into your nursery operation. You're looking at, if you propagate it on site, how that's done, what are your cleanliness practices in order to do the uh, collection. And then you're looking at how you're growing those plants, and then you're looking at your scrap. So it's looking at plants all the way through the system to ensure that you're handling them properly. And then the importance of the scrap at the very end, everybody has scrap, it's how you manage it is what's most important so that you don't contaminate your, your soil or your pots or your other items. And I'll go through some of these in a little more detail. Um, so you're looking at your hazards in the nursery, and like I said, it includes a scouting program, a training program, and a record program. And the reason why we're doing this is because we just don't know what the next pest, of, pest du jour is gonna be. So we wanna be able to address all of them, all the unknowns that are out there to the best of our ability. So what's at risk? You've already heard a lot this morning about what is at risk, so I won't go through that. So I'm gonna briefly go through the document itself, and this just gives you a few examples of items, so I just put the top page of uh, one or two of them. So uh, the first item that I had mentioned before at the top of the list was plants. So with this, uh, with this document, let me see if I can get this. There we go. Go. Um, okay, so you're looking at your components. Are they imported cuttings? Are they bare root tissue culture? Are they from a domestic source? Or are they from uh, offshore? You come over and you look at the contamination hazard, and then you identify, you look at the BMP that would be addressing it. And the number of times there will be multiple BMPs that will be addressing the same critical control point because you want to employ multiple BMPs to prevent a pest from coming in, for example, just on the plants themselves. So the question might be, you know, are you purchasing it, from, purchasing it from state certified sources? Are you inspecting all the deliveries and scouting for roots, uh, leaf and root pests and pa uh, pathogens? And so these are just standard things that you would be doing if you bought in product or if you're going to go out and collect the product from the field, you're going to make sure you're collecting it from disease free looking plants or that there are no insects, eggs laid on the plants, that type of thing. And if you're taking cuttings in the field or you're doing propagation or divisions, um, you know, you might employ, if it's, a, if it's a, a plant that's very sensitive to various pathogens like phytophthoras, then you might decide that you are going to dip your clippers in a chlorine bleach 10% solution every third cutting that you take. Because in a large scale nursery, where the teams are out there taking millions of cuttings. So if it's a high-risk plant, this is not a pea or more plant at all, but if it's a high-risk plant that's very susceptible to pathogens, you may want to go out and, in this case, treat the field before you make the cut it, take the cuttings. 
You take the cuttings, now you've created all these wounds and you'll want to treat again afterwards. So for large operations, this is a, well, it's a standard practice at our facility. And field cuttings, you want to ensure that you have, you know, clean stock. And then we move on and we take a look at the media and the containers, which is the next critical control point. Once again, we take, if we look at pots and trays, you know, are you going to use used pots and trays? Are you going to disinfect them? Are you going to use new pots and are you going to store them appropriately so they don't get contaminated on your site? When you talk about media, you know, are you growing, are you using media that's clean or disinfested? Or are you storing it properly? Are you using field equipment that's clean? You're not sharing it between your um, your potting mix area where you're mixing the material and you're not using that same equipment when you go out to the field. So with that in mind, I just real quick, this is an example of a grower that had used uh, some of their compost material and some of their fresh material. And so uh, when we were out at the site not that long ago, Kathy and I were kind of digging around in the soil and this particular nursery had Phytophthora morum and we saw that in that composted material, they had a label of, from camellia plants that had been part of the composting. Well, camellias are a high-risk plant. They are one of the plants that was found to be positive on their nursery. They were composting it. Maybe they were doing it for the correct cure amount of time, you know, for the curing process. Maybe yes, maybe no, but you have to decide, do you want to take that risk? And do you not compost certain high-risk plants? And then also we noticed that their equipment was being used in the field as well as being used to mix their piles. So you're potentially, you may have all clean material to start with and you're potentially contaminating it by not thinking through your production practices. Same thing, Kathy showed this picture with uh, these piles of redwood sawdust. That's one of the components for this particular nursery. And um, they have it on an asphalt slab. Well, not everybody can have an asphalt slab. So in this case, um, we had the opportunity to go out to Watershed and work with Diana and Laura. And this is what their situation looked like before. And they had you know, some, uh, some potting work that was being done over here. They, had, they did have it lined, but it was only lined on the bottom. And the pile was up above the walls here. So Diana went, and Laura went to work and they did a great job with regards to raising the walls so they could address any windblown issues. They did a, a lovely job putting in a pond liner, which is very thick tarp that goes, thank you, that goes um, from the sides, wraps all the way around and up the side. It's laying down there right now. So they're addressing the soil, the waterborne, and the windblown pathogens. So they wanna make sure they keep their product clean. I'm gonna zip along a little bit faster. Uh, containers, you have to make a decision you know, you have clean containers, brand new, and a number of nurseries use recycled containers. There are various ways to deal with the uh, dirty containers, if you so choose to use them, is that you can set up your own cleaning system so you can uh, disinfest those particular pots. Also at Diana's facility, it was uh, great. She raised all of her clean pots off the surface of the soil or surface of the gravel so that it wasn't in contact anymore. So these are simple things that you can do that aren't that expensive, um, that give you the, um, that reduce your risk of introducing pathogens into your operation. Uh, then we go on to water. It talks about water, all different forms of water, the irrigation that you use or splash dispersal uh, in your facility, or if you're, the type of water that you use, is it recycled, recaptured, or is it city water? And then you have to identify any risks that you feel that might be associated with those and how you're going to mitigate those. In this case, you might choose to recycle your water or use chlorine dioxide or UV or ozonation to clean your water. And these are homemade setups. You can, you know, there's a lot of things that can be done inexpensively. And then, as I said, water includes standing water, how you're going to mitigate that. Some growers decided to raise their product up uh, they have the weed barrier here, and then they also have the weed barrier there so they could not have the splash. And then others, you know, raising it up even higher off the ground. This one just uh, shows a picture of splash dispersal from the vehicles onto potential host material. 
And then transitioning from water and the soil substrate contaminants, you know, I understand that you do have to grow uh, some crops that do require a lot of water. And so, you know, the situation, they, um, it might be acceptable because they do need a lot of water. However, you know, if it's month after month and you start to get this buildup here, you might decide that you want to elevate these even higher off the ground because it looks like you're starting to get, you know, con uh, soil and whatnot built up underneath that's touching the bottom of these sleeves so that you could potentially be bringing phytophthoras swimming up that uh, when the contact is made there. Scrap piles, as I mentioned, everybody has a scrap pile. It's how you manage it. This particular one I just wanted to show is where they, they have their scrap here. Unfortunately, this is a 1% slope that slopes right to where they mix their media. So when you're doing your assessment, you said you would think, yes, that's creating a hazard. I need to do something about moving that someplace else. And that falls into your field layout plan. And that's where we come in here with your field layout. You might be on a 500-acre nursery. You might be on a 5-acre nursery. You need to look at your processes and identify what's the simplest means by which to move your, do your, your processes. So in other words, your propagation or divisions where you move them then to go on to do canning, where your soil pile is in relationship to that. So you have to take all of that into consideration. I won't go through this. Um, talking about equipment, Kathy had mentioned, you know, you need to clean your equipment that you're gonna use, whether it's on large scale or small scale, being your clippers and your shovels and things like that, or your tires on your trucks here, or if you're gonna have sanitation pads to step on before you go into your greenhouse or research facility, which is what that is. So we're, I've gone through a number of BMPs, and Kathy has too, and so people usually ask, you know, where can these BMPs be validated? And at the National Ornamental Research Site at Dominican University, which is the acronym NORSDUC, this is our team right here. There's, there's six of us, and this is what our facility looks like. I'll jump through these because I kind of want to get to the research that we're doing. This is, uh, it allows for in-ground research, and that's where Jennifer Park is doing her solar solarization for the past couple of years, looking at uh, the various depths that you can find Phytophthora morum and uh, how long it takes to solarize it and kill the pathogen entirely. And then um, we're also looking at P. tentaculata. And each of the sites, each of the workspace that people have, these are researchers that come in from across the country to do their work at our facility on Phytophthora morum, and then we're expanding out to other pathogens also. Uh, they have a workspace, their proposal is reviewed by us and USDA before a decision is made that they can come to the facility to work. But we have a UV system set up with a, uh, a pool filter first before it goes through UV. We have water testing capabilities, and I'll show some of those slides. This is when it was, one of the sites was set up. It has a pond liner that's, I think, Vernon, what's the thickness on that? 30 mil thick. So that anything that rains down from anywhere in here gets collected, runs across that tarp and gets collected and processed by that UV filter system that we have to disinfect the water. And this is just how it's being set up and then each of the researchers has their own, uh, another pond liner on the bed itself and they can do, um, research on potted material, or they can, they can do it on uh, in-ground. We have in-ground ones, too. Uh, we can take water samples whenever we want. Baiting is the uh, possibilities. And then just the phytosanitation, the pads that we have there before going in, the UV system, the sentinel plants that we use to capture any phytophthora coming in or going out. And we've, um, Tomas Vestalka and Susan Latham have found a new phytophthora phallus um, on eucalyptus and rhododendrons, but we won't go into that. Uh, this is our quarantine area. Every, all plants we bring in, we hold them for six weeks to do an assessment before we use them in the research plots or before we allow the researchers to use them to ensure that they're not harboring any pathogens. Uh, work that we have done in the past, uh, looking at biological control agents and mixings uh, in potting mix, as well as in the soil substrate, looking at suppressive soils, survival studies on pyramorum, solar solarization and soil steaming, a multi-state project that I'll mention in a moment, root-to-root -root spread of Phytophthora morum, and then looking at abiotic stress on root infections. With regards to water, we're looking at, you know, what does it take, the, what's the pyramorum threshold in irrigation water to cause an infection on plants when there's overhead irrigation, different types of water disinfection, and then early on some fungicide trials and foliar transfer trials. 
uh, the steaming that we've done. Uh, the technology was implemented at a commercial wholesale nursery as, after it was um, worked on for a year at Norisduck and it worked and eliminated Phytophthora morum from the soil. When it was used at a wholesale nursery, it was released from the federal order. So USDA has accepted this as a means by which to eliminate Phytophthora morum from the soil substrate. Uh, we then moved on to a multi-state project in Washington, Oregon, and California. This is what our steaming unit looks like. This is what it looks, and before I forget, um, if you're interested in coming out to see our facility, uh, you can work through Elisa, if she doesn't mind, and uh, we'd be happy to give people tours of the facility. And this is Vernon Huffman, who's in the back there, who's our nursery manager, and this is where it's set up that we had at a, a wholesale nursery up in Northern California for soil steaming. Vernon also had the opportunity to go to, to Hawaii and help them with the coconut rhino beetle that showed up you know, six months ago or so. And he worked at the uh, Joint Military Base in Oahu, Hawaii. And so you can see the, the steaming, here's the unit here and here's the area that was being steamed. Solarization, this is Jennifer Park's work. This is what we were able to accomplish for her is to excavate an area bring in heavy clay soil, compact it, and then bring in somebody with an auger so they could actually drill into that soil to put her probes in there and also her sachets because we were, she was um, bearing rhododendron leaf discs that were infected with Phytophthora morum at three different levels, 30 centimeters, 15 centimeters, and five centimeters, and then doing the solarization here. And she ran the solarization for a total of six weeks, but during the summer she was finding that between two and four weeks is long enough when it's really hot, and that uh, it kills everything down to 30 centimeters or down to the 12 inches. So that was uh, very effective. And now uh, this is a multi-state project where Kathy Costa has been helping to identify and work with nurseries to set this up to look at the different soil types in California, Oregon, and Washington, and then different parts of the state so we can see um, how long does it take when you're dealing with different types of soil, and also how long does it take when you have different thickness of layer of the gravel. Some people have an inch, some people have five inches of gravel. How does that impact it also? Um, just very briefly, um, disinfectants for nursery equipment. These are future projects. Um, you know, there is no control for Phytophthora morum, and so as they were mentioning about equipment transporting clods of dirt that are infected, um, I think one of my bigger t concerns is the um, and it's been identified by Yana, yeah, Yana, up in uh, Humboldt area, and she's identified that these um, harvesting, log harvesting equipment can transport clods of infested dirt with Phytophthora morum uh, that they've been shown to be infected with the pathogen. And, and if they're then put on trailers, these, uh, these heavy equipment, either also for firefighting, and it's shared between various counties, this is a mechanism for potentially moving Phytophthora morum around in the forested areas. Uh, we're looking at improved water detection methods out of Fort Detrick, Maryland. This researcher is looking at the protein in the flagella of the zoospore so that it can be more easily detected because it's, um, we need an improved method, a more uh, accurate and a more a quicker method by which to determine if water is infected with Phytophthora morum because there's been a number of um, locations across the country, about eight different states now have Phytophthora morum in streams as a result of being released from nurseries. Nine out of 10 times it's associated with an infected nursery. In one case, it's not, a, it's not associated with a nursery, but that's, that's a problem. And so there's another group of researchers out of Washington State that are saying, okay, let's try and contain that infected water on the site. So let's look at constructed wetlands uh, on the nursery site before that water leaves the nursery so that we protect the environment basically. Uh, another researcher is looking at the genotypes of Phytophthora morum, identified that in nurseries there's many more genotypes and there are unique genotypes that are created in the nursery uh, more so than in the forest. And um, Matteo Gabrilato is doing that work and he started out with four different isolates, one from soil, one from water, one from foliage, and one a combination. After six months of his project, it was identified that they were that there were then seven genotypes. So he had three unique ones that were created in the process of the work that he was doing. So that's a concern because it might have the, uh, these new genotypes of Phytophthora more might be more resistant to fungicides or fungistats basically, or other aspects of that. 
Uh, VOCs, I love this one, it's volatile, or, volatile organic compounds. It's being used heavily with citrus greening in Florida, the pathogens it's wiping out the, the citrus industry in Florida, and the, uh, the psyllid vector that transmits the pathogen has been found in Calif all over Southern California, basically. And so there's a group out of UC Davis, a number of researchers that are working on these volatile organic compounds, and they're able to detect trees that are infected versus trees that aren't. We have a co-worker with us, uh, Rick Vostok out of UC Davis, that has put in a grant proposal to work with these individuals on Phytophthora morum to look at um, detecting infected plants versus healthy plants using these volatile, volatile organic compounds. And the advantage of that is um, over the years, imports into the United States, uh, the top four plants imported into the U.S. over a five-year period are all the high-risk plants for Phytophthora morum. It's rhododendrons, viburnums, pieris, and uh, camellias. And there's millions that are coming into the country. Well, if you haven't got a good way of detecting, you know, these, are, these could be um, rooted cuttings or they could be cuttings. If you don't have a good way to detect it, then you're just potentially bringing these pathogens into the country. And, and as the other speakers has shown, there have, the way the peer morm has moved around has unfortunately been a lot to do with the nursery industry. So I'm sorry to rush through that. I know I'm over time, so I'll stop here. And this is just some uh, additional work that we're doing at our facility. So thank you. Any questions? Sure. She was asking about the use of biological controls for Phytophthora morum. The work that we've done is with a researcher out of Fort Detrick, Maryland, and he's been looking at uh, Trichoderma aspirellum. And it has been, as a standalone biocontrol, it's been about 90% effective. That's not good enough. But when it's in combination with the soil uh, solarization and followed after that process, or if it's used after the steaming, in other words, you eliminated all the phytophthora in the soil, so you'd like to put something back in that's beneficial to fill those niches. It's a great combination, and we found it to be very, very effective. He's also <laughs> looking at incorporating it into soil mixes so it can be used to, um, you know, to eliminate or reduce phytophthora in the soil, that type of thing. So the work is still ongoing with regards to that. What's the occurrence of that working in the soil? Can you use the mic? Sure, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, Diana was Diana was asking with regards to the trichoderma, what's the prevalence of that in the native soils? And the trichoderma that was used for this biological control agent was uh, identified and taken from the soil, actually. So, and there's other reasons. There's a lot of trichodermas, and there's another group that's looking at atraviridae, and then some products are already on the market with regards to Root Shield Plus that has a trichoderma in it also but this one that we're working with and the Washington people are working with is a different uh, species. Okay, thank you.